May it please the court, counsel, full counsel, Daniel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. April 10th, 1993, Armando Lasso and Robert England were murdered in Northeast El Paso. At about 12.18 in the morning on Holy Saturday. Good Friday, the night before, was when they had been out. And 12.18 on Holy Saturday in 1983, those two young men were murdered. There's no question about that. This is Northeast El Paso, and this is a pertinent area. The mountain, Trans Mountain, uh, excuse me, uh, Mount Franklin is on this side over here. North is in this direction over here. East would be in this direction here. That's Trans Mountain Road. That's Fairbanks Road. This is Electric Street as it was known then, now known as Girl Scout Lane. Jesse Hernandez, Juan Medina, are the two survivors and victims as well. They were with Armando Lasso and Robert Ingle. And all four of those young men had gone to a party. Really a gathering, not so much a party. They went to go talk to some girls, visit with some girls as young men do in their teenage years, just to kind of hang around. And they stayed there for a while, uh, and they had some of their friends there. They had a ride there. Their friends eventually left and said, I'll come back and get you all. And they waited and they waited, and then after a little while, the party got a little late. It wasn't quite midnight, but the parents said, okay, boys, you all have to go home. The parents of the girls at the house. And they said, okay, let's go outside. So they went out in the street and they said, let's wait for our ride. And they stood there and they waited a while and they waited a while and the ride didn't come. And finally, Jesse said, tells the boys, you know what, we're making too much noise here. It's disrespectful to the household and to the, to the parents. Let's just, let's just go on. Let's go over to Armando's home, which they live out in this area here. And he decided, let's do that. So the easiest way for them to get to their home would be to go to Fairbanks and walk right down Fairbanks. But they didn't do that. And Jesse Hernandez will tell you they didn't do that, and he's going to tell you the route they took. And they decided, you know what, this is a real bad area here. There's some bad gangbangers there. In 1993, El Paso had a real gang problem, not only in Northeast El Paso, but especially in Northeast El Paso. And there were some really bad people living in that area that was their territory. They wouldn't even let some people drive down the street because it was their territory. The Flores Brothers. You're going to hear about them. You're going to hear they're the ones that actually committed the offense. And so they decided the shortest way would have been to go to Fairbanks, but they wanted to avoid problems. They specifically wanted to avoid the Flores' turf. And the reason they wanted to avoid the Flores' turf is because Armando Lasso had been threatened by the Flores' on more than one occasion. He threatened he was going to kill him. So the boys decided to walk down the street. And that's what they did. That's approximately the location where Robert England was shot and Armando Lasso was shot. Less than a quarter mile away, Rudy Flores and Javier Flores live in that home right there on Shenandoah. Right across Fairbanks, that street turns into Shenandoah. And that's where they live. That's his home. So what are the critical events that happened prior to April 10th of 1993? We know that two weeks before the murder, two weeks before the murder, Rudy Flores threatens Armando Lasso. He tells him, I'm going to kill you. They're at a party on the east side. And Terrence Farrar, who you will hear from, separates the fight. Rudy Flores is threatening one of Armando Lasso's friends. Armando Lasso steps in front, says, separate, uh, you know, leave him alone. And then Rudy Flores says, I'm going to kill you. Let's take it outside. He goes outside, and then Terrence Farrar gets in the way and says, Armando, don't go out there. This guy's dangerous. Leave him alone. Rudy Flores leaves. And before he leaves, he says, I'm going to kill you. And he leaves. One week before the murder, the Flores brothers, both of them, threatened Armando Lasso again at school. And you're going to hear from Esa Barripa, 
the campus patrol who witnessed the fight. And witnessed the fight between the Flores brothers and Armando Lasso, and witnessed the Flores brothers say, I'm gonna break you and point at him. I'm gonna kill you. One week before, the day Armando Lasso and Robert England were murdered, fulfilling Rudy's promise. I think the evidence is going to show. Rudy Flores gave a statement to Detective Al Marquez. The German object just to the hearsay in the motion of the Overruled. That on April 14th of 1993, he gets a statement because Rudy, Rudy Flores in his own statement to the detective says the next day he was a suspect. One of the officers went to go see him. Where were you? What were you doing? Immediate suspect, Rudy Flores. After the shooting, 1218 is when it occurred. So when Rudy Flores talks to the detective McDaniels, he says, oh no, I was here. I was home. I was home all alone. That's where I was. Except that in his statement, he says, well, where were you? He says, well, I was with some friends, Jose Juarez, Betty, and we went over to Ben's house. Where does Ben live? Ben lives on Jamaica Street. Where? Well, interestingly enough, that's where Ben lives, and that's where the party was. And Rudy Flores tells the detective, you know, I saw some boys outside on Jamaica Street when I drove by, and they just kind of stared at me. He didn't say they mad dogged me, but he said he just they just kind of stared at me. But I ignored him and drove right by. Okay. And that's approximately the location where they had this cat and mouse game with a vehicle that the prosecutor told you about with the with the four victims. The victims initially thought that's our ride. That's all right, but from the distance in the dark, they really couldn't tell, and then they kind of went cat and mouse, and they went ahead and they went away. So the boys continued walking there. And what happens? What happens at 1218? Well, we know what happens at 1218 because the Gormans, who lives right across the street from where this incident occurred, heard, heard five or six consecutive shots. We know there were six because we found six shell casings, the, the, the evidence the police found, right on the street outside their home. The Gormans were in their bedroom. It was at 1218. Mr. Gorman called 911. Mrs. Gorman looks out the window. Then there's, within seconds after the shots, they hear a frantic knocking on the door. And it's Armando Lasso that's going there for help, right? He's he knocking on the door. He opened the door and he collapses in their doorway. But we know at the time that it occurred simply because of the 911 call that came in. Rudy Flores places himself at the scene of the crime, at 1218, in his own words. Because he says in his statement, because see, Rudy Flores is street smart. So he's, got, he's concerned that somebody might have seen my car drive by there. So how do I explain my car drove by there? So he says in his statement, Oh, I went and dropped off Betty, and then I went down Trans Mountain Road. He tells them the route that the boys took, and then I drove up Electric Street because I wanted to go straight to my house. And when I drove by there, there was no lights, no sirens, and I didn't see anything. But what time did you drive by there? And Rudy Flores' own words says between 12.15 and 12.20. That's his words to the police, to the detective. He puts himself at the scene, opportunity, at the time that the offense occurred. Less than 24 hours later, less than a quarter mile away, Rudy Flores is present in another shoot. That's his home. Another shooting occurs at that home. The home of Robert Wayne Williams, where Rudy Flores is a witness to a separate shooting. He's a one-man terror, terrorizing that community. The detective's investigation that they did during the course revealed that in 1993, at least five or six different people admitted to the shooting. Five or six different, whatever, for whatever reason, 
They were either bragging, they were just talking, uh, wanted to be tough. But they were, the detectives got information from five or six different individuals that all admitted to the shooting of Armando Lasso and Robert Ingle. The two surviving victims, Jesse Hernandez and Juan Medina, you will hear, they were accused by Detective Al Marcus of committing a murder. Jesse Hernandez was a young man, 16, 17 years old. Okay. He's a victim. He's victimized. His two friends were killed. He goes down to give a statement. They take him down and what does a detective that's been a, being a detective for 14 years, very experienced, he says, I know you did it. So just tell me, I know you did it. Your friend already gave you up. You committed the offense and I know you did it. He said, I didn't do it. You're going to hear from Jesse. You're going to hear how he was terrorized by the detective. Because they had no evidence. So they're just accusing, in his mind, you had to have done it. He said, I didn't do it. Jesse Hernandez is going to tell you that he was so terrorized, he was so scared by Detective uh, Marquez, he was so bullied, that he said to himself, maybe I did it. I might have blacked out. Jesse Hernandez came this close to admitting to something he didn't do. Because he, he kept thinking to himself, and he's going to tell you. That's what the evidence is going to show. That I thought I, I thought I might have done it. Did I black out? Did I hurt my friends? I, it doesn't make sense. I wouldn't do that. He knows he didn't do it. But how vulnerable is a 16-year-old boy in the hands of an experienced homicide detective who's telling you, your friend already told me you did it. So just admit it. Or you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life? You're going to get the electric chair? You can imagine the terror of that boy. You're going to see it. You're going to hear it. <coughs> what evidence implicates Daniel? There's no physical evidence. There's no forensic evidence. There's no scientific evidence. There's no eyewitness testimony. There's no fingerprints. There's no DNA. <coughs> the prosecutor likes to tell you that David Angel, his cousin, after he spoke with Daniel, thought it was his duty and he called the police. He said, I gotta turn in my cousin. That's not what happened. David Angel, you're gonna hear from him. What the evidence is gonna show is that the detectives were under a lot of pressure to solve this case. So they started looking around for different suspects. And they found that David Angel had a charge pending against him for telephone harassment. So they call, looking for David Ronhead, who was 17 years old at the time, and they talked to his mother. They said, we're looking for David Ronhead, what for? Well, this is about a telephone harassment. We need to, him to come in to sign some papers and we'll get it straightened out. So Mrs. K, David's mother, calls David and says, David, the police are looking for you for this telephone harassment. Will you contact them? Oh, what'd they say? They said, just sign some papers and they'll, and, and they'll, they'll take care of the case. So David calls them. He calls him for that reason. He walks in, he says, I'm here about that. He goes, well, I want to talk to you about something. What? He goes, we know you did the murder on electric street. He goes, what? He goes, we know you did the murder. The cussing, the threats, the intimidation. You're going to hear it from David on him, who at this moment still remembers it vividly. 17-year-old boy. He was accused. He goes, we know you did it. He said, we have witnesses that say you did it. They said, I didn't do it. He goes, yes, you did. He goes, and you know something about it. I don't know anything about it. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, we're going to send you to prison. You're going to go to prison for life. You're going to get fucked in prison. Those are the words the detective used. That's what's going to happen to you. Pretty white boy like you. That's what they told him. Those green eyes, you're going to be at the mercy. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. Goes, well, then you know, you know something. If you don't, you better tell us who did. He says, well... Are you talking about a phone call I had with my cousin? David, his cousin to Daniel Villegas. David used to spend a lot of time with Daniel Villegas. And sometime before this, David had called Daniel. And Daniel was with Marcus Gonzalez, another friend of his. And he tells him, 
He goes, hey, what's going on? What'd you do this weekend? Hey, did you hear about the shooting? He goes, yeah. He goes, hey, guess who did it? He goes, who did it? He goes, we did. And then he starts laughing. He goes, oh, don't believe him. Marco says, don't believe him. He's bullshit. And he goes, yeah, what'd you do? How'd you do that? Really? He goes, yeah, with a shotgun. Well, the forensic evidence shows there wasn't a shotgun. And then he goes, no, just, I'm just kidding. So they told David on him. They knew it was a joke. It wasn't true. He didn't know what type of weapon. And David on says, he tells you to take the Marcus. He told me that, but he was joking. It wasn't true. No, 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 no. You're going to write this statement, and you're going to put what I want you to put in this statement. And don't mention anything about the gun, because it doesn't match the evidence. And that's how they went to, to Daniel Spiegas. But it wasn't that David Ron Hill all of a sudden had this epiphany that I got to go and somehow turn in my cousin. That was nothing like that. In fact, the person that has opportunity and motive and was prophetic was Flux Brothers. Daniel didn't know Armando Lasso, didn't know Robert Ingram, didn't know Jesse Hernandez, didn't know Juan Medina. Daniel never met any of those. You have a 41-year-old man in this courtroom, but I'm going to have to take you back to a 16-year-old boy that he was. Because that's who they say committed the offense, the 16-year-old boy. And you'll see what he looked like when he was 16. Just like when you see David on here testify, he's a 42-year-old man. He was 17 years old back then. Prosecutors tried to tell you that there was a person that uh, was at the mall with a friend and that David and that allegedly Daniel went up to him and said, yeah, I'm the one that, that did the shooting. You know what they didn't tell you? Is that that lady, Angelica Hernandez, that was at the mall, didn't know Daniel, had never met Daniel, never spoke to Daniel, never reported it, this alleged statement. But 16 years after that day, 16 years after the day, when there's publicity about this case, she sends an email, you know, I think maybe, so maybe I know the guy that, uh, that, 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 that did it. Because I was at this, at the, I was 15 years old at the time with my friend. I was going to a movie. And although I don't know Dave, Daniel Villegas when I was 15, I remember somebody came up to me and said, there was two other people and said, hey, we did the shootings on electric steam. She didn't know him. She didn't recognize him. 16 years go by, she doesn't report it, and all of a sudden she's trying to say, maybe it was, maybe it was Daniel. That's the type of evidence they want you to, to put. And then they mentioned some individual that while Daniel was in custody for a period of time, it said, I guess he's going to say that, that Daniel had committed to him. If it's the same individual they've been talking to us about, Oni Kirk, this is a person that has numerous, numerous convictions for crimes of moral turpitude, robbery, theft. He's a liar and he's a thief. And right after he was sent to prison for 12 years, he calls him and says, hey, by the way, I know who did I know who did it. They, he confessed to me. He didn't know Daniel. He said he didn't even know who he was until Detective Marcus pointed him out to him. And somehow that's how they're trying to make that connection. They are desperate. They are desperate. Quantum leaps. No physical evidence. No forensic evidence. The police were under enormous investigation. Prosecutor tells you to open a statement. They follow the lead. They follow the evidence. Did they really? You have Rudy Flores, who had opportunity motive and had threatened those individuals. And the police department had those statements from Terrence Ferrar, who said, I was there when he threatened them. I was there when he said he was going to kill him. So what is Rudy, well in that statement Rudy Foote says, when I drove by between 12.15 and 12.20 and I didn't see anything else, I went to bed. I'm one to two minutes away from my home and I went to bed. So they take the statement from his brother, Javier. 
Flores. And Javier Flores says, well, I was home at 12.30. Uh, and Rudy wasn't home. So what's interesting to me is how, if you're a detective, and you supposedly follow the evidence, how is it if you're a detective, and you see these alibis that are con conflicting, they don't cooperate each other, they had had an opportunity at the time the offense occurred, they were there. I was home at 12.30, uh, and Rudy wasn't home. So what's interesting to me is how, if you're a detective, and you supposedly follow the evidence, how is it if you're a detective, and you see these alibis that are con conflicting, they don't cooperate each other, they had had an opportunity at the time the offense occurred, they were there. And they had had prior incidents. And they had had prior threats. And they had actually told them, I'm going to kill you. Two weeks before, and then one week before. Those are pretty solid leads. Pretty strong leads. Follow the evidence. They didn't do that. They did a horrible job. And what the prosecutors are trying to do is make up for the lack of investigation that the detectives did. I am very confident that at the end of this trial, you're going to return a verdict of not guilty. We look forward to visiting with you further. Thank you.